I'm Cole Harrison, Executive Director of Mass Peace Action. I want to welcome you all tonight for our program on peace psychology. Uh, we are joined by the innovators who founded the Engaging Peace Project uh, 10 years ago, both the blog and the newsletter of Engaging Peace, which is, takes a psychological view of the roots of conflict, the roots of war, roots of atrocities. Why do people follow authorities and do terrible things? Why do people even consider killing their fellow humans in wars? They've been thinking deep and hard about these problems. They've been writing about it and they have now joined forces with Mass Peace Action. Mass Peace Action has taken over responsibility for managing the Engaging Peace blog archives. We're not going to continue it as an ongoing live blog, but we are uh, going to involve uh, Kathy, Pat, and Joe in MAPA, and they'll be conti continuing, or maybe even some of their collaborators, we hope, will continue uh, writing and, and cartooning and getting the message out through MAPA's website, newsletter, social media, and, and so on. Um, so uh, tonight, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Pat Daniels, and she's going to explain what we're going to do the rest of the evening and introduce the speakers. Pat. Yes, I'm Pat Daniel. Um, I'm going to be moderating this session. I am the managing editor and co-founder with Kathy Melly Morrison of Engaging Peace. Um, I was... I began my peace activism with the nuclear weapons freeze campaign back in the 1980s and held leadership positions with mass freeze voter. Um, I've also spent a lot of my career on environmental and sustainability issues uh, at Polaroid, at Ceres, and then at Marlboro College where I chaired the MBA in managing for, psychology, uh, managing for sustainability. Um, I was one of Kathy's graduate students a long, long time ago and um, also a teaching fellow for her. So it's great to be working with her again on engaging peace. So let me, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Kathy and Joe so that I don't have to do this again, interrupting the flow of the presentation. So Kathy Malley Morrison is president and principal author of Engaging Peace, a retired professor of psychology from Boston University. She has conducted extensive research on international perspectives on war and peace and published six books and many book chapters and articles on that topic, as well as numerous others on family violence. Her work for peace and social justice has been re recognized by awards from the American Psychological Association, Psychologists for Social Responsibility, and Swarthmore College. She is a founding member of the U.S. Peace Memorial Foundation, and happy to be a new member of MAPA. Joe Cartoon, our uh, Joe Cartoon, Joe uh -huh. Cartoon, otherwise known as Joe Cartoon. <laughs> Sorry about that, Joe. <laughs> uh, Joe Kandra, our cartoonist extraordinaire, has been a graphic designer, illustrator, and cartoonist since the days when PCs and Macs were toys and floppy disks were eight inches wide. He graduated in the pre-internet world with a BA in theater and almost immediately realized he needed a job. Having grown up in a home filled with his mother's painting, studio, and art students, Joe somehow absorbed enough knowledge to spend many years as a designer in corporate marketing departments. After he got tired of layoffs and acquisitions, Joe embarked on a career of freelance graphic design. He also currently serves as an associate regional rep for the New England region of the Graphic Arts Guild, which is quite an honor. So um, now we'll begin the presentation. Thank you, Cole, so much for inviting us to do this webinar. It's a real exciting moment for Engaging Peace to share the work that we've been doing over all these years with a broader audience. I'm now going to shift to the screen share so that um, you can see our slides. All right, so um, Cole mentioned that we are in this transition period where engaging peace, this little star in the firmament of peace activism is endeavoring to join up with a bigger star or sun 
in the firmament, mass peace action, and hoping that together we'll be able to share, shed even more light. This is a cartoon that, um, and you'll be hearing a lot more about cartoons tonight, but this is one example of the ways that we have expressed pictorially uh, what we want to tell the world. Okay, there we go. Um, the goals for this webinar are first to motivate you to check out the Engaging Peace blog. As Cole said, it's going to be, the archives are going to be held by MAPA and it's full of all kinds of good information. You're gonna get a taste of that information tonight and hopefully that taste will incentivize you to want to read more. We also want to acquaint you with key concepts in the psychology of peace. Psychology, you know, is about attitudes, behavior, ways of thinking, motivation, language, prejudices, all those things that are so confusing and curious about the human mind and human behavior. So the, what we're gonna focus primarily on tonight is this particular aspect of psychology of peace, why people engage in war and other atrocities and what to do about it. The next thing we want to do in our, our goals for tonight are to acquaint you with the power of political cartoons, which Joe will talk about. And finally, to inspire you, to inspire your activism and to inspire some dialogue with you. In fact, at the end of our presentation, I'm going to pose a question for discussion, which is basically going to ask you, how might you apply what you've learned tonight? How might these concepts of peace psychology be used in your own life and in your activist work? So we'll come back to that and hopefully have a, a nice discussion about that. So our mission at Engaging Peace has been to educate a general audience about peace psychology and alternatives to warfare. The general audience concept here is what's important. Uh, we want to get peace psychology out of academia and into the minds of the people who are actually working toward peace and against war. And secondly, to foster engagement and activism for the cause of world peace. So this educate plus activism yields our tagline from study to action. So we want to learn what, um, take advantage of what we've learned in research theory about peace and violence and turn it into action, promote activism. It all started in 2010, Kathy and I got together after not seeing each other for about 30 years. And I said, hey, what's going on? And she said, well, I've been teaching and doing research for decades and I'm yearning to get the message of peace psychology out to a broader audience. And I said, hey, what you need is a blog. So um, we started a blog and uh, of course we didn't know what we were doing, but we bumbled our way into it. And uh, before you knew it, we decided we also needed a newsletter. So we added a newsletter and then we decided we needed to be a 501c3 nonprofit. So we um, got the uh, credentials for that and uh, have a wonderful board of directors and puttered along with uh, the blog for about a, almost a decade. And then Kathy said, you know, most of our posts are text. We have some videos, we have some art, some poetry, but what about adding some cartoons? So that launched us into the era where cartoons have become a significant ingredient in the Engaging Peace blog. And we teamed up with Joe Kandra uh, to do that. So please, uh, when you have a chance, go to engagingpeace.com. You'll see that there are about a thousand posts. Most of them have been um, authored by Kathy, but we've also had the privilege of enjoying the work of 65 guest authors, many of whom are from uh, other countries. Readers have engaged in active uh, dialogue with us, submitting about 5,500 comments, and we've got about 40 cartoons for you to take a look at. 
this is a word cloud that gives you a sense of the content of the Engaging Peace blog. Obviously, peace is at the centerpiece. Um, activism is key. We have a lot of cartoons. It's an international audience as well as international uh, writers. The topics are often about weapons, military, um, terrorism, and so forth. The environment comes in. We've We've written about um, how the military contributes to climate change the, and about cer certain um, conflicts like in Iraq and so forth. We've encouraged our, our writers and commentators, the readers, to submit stories of their own work where on the ground they are doing, taking actions to promote peace. Fundamentally, the blog is about psychology and there are three words here that are really where we're gonna to focus tonight. Moral disengagement and moral engagement. Um, moral disengagement is the ways in which we deceive ourselves in, and rationalize our actions that are violent, believing that we still can be moral people. Self-deception, so that we can consider ourselves good people. And then moral engagement is the opposite of that. This is actions and commitments that are uh, meant to contribute to a positive society, caring toward people, not undermining the, um, the good, the overall good. So given that um, overview of Engaging Peace, I'm now going to introduce Kathy, Mally Morrison, who's going to speak about our topic tonight, why people engage in war and other atrocities and what to do about it, the psychology of moral disengagement and moral engagement. Kathy. War is fundamentally a moral issue. Waging war violates the most universal moral code ever evolved by human beings. The golden rule, next slide. Examples of the golden rule have been identified in 11 world religions. This slide shows just a small sample of them. Given the universality and haloed status of the golden rule, how come so many people kick it all to hell and not back? The field of moral psychology provides some answers, particularly in the work of Albert Bandura and others in moral disengagement and moral engagement slide. Let's focus first on moral disengagement. This slide lists principal types of moral disengagement. Moral disengagement involves processes of self-deception, ways of thinking that allow people to commit violent, inhumane acts and not feel guilty. Indeed, moral disengagement often allows people to feel quite proud of rather horrified acts. Think, for example, about some of those gloating January 6 perpetrators and the insiders who admire them. Next slide. Not next slide. One form of moral disengagement is pseudo-moral justifications. That's when people convince themselves or are convinced by their leaders that killing is okay if done for a higher cause, like God or national security. Also common is blaming or dehumanizing your victims, like saying they started it and calling them vermin or cockroaches. We've all been bombarded for weeks by another form of moral disengagement, specifically euphemistic labeling. That involves using disarming and deceptive language when referring to violence perpetrated by one's own group. Can you guess what pervasive recent example of euphemistic labeling I mean? Or have you missed the Republican reframing of the January 6 mobs we all watched on TV. They're insisting that the attackers on the Capitol were not insurrectionists, 
but simply tourists engage in peaceful protests. Next slide. This cartoon entitled Clever Devils, Getting Good People to Act Bad, shows a white farmer brandishing a smoking gun and a knife over a black child's dead body. The caption for this cartoon, not shown here, is in self-defense. If I hadn't have killed you, you would have grown up to rule me. Hmm, how legitimate a fear could that have been? Sounds sort of like white supremacy theory, doesn't it? In fact, this editorial cartoon was published in 1876, early in the period of Jim Crow, whose ugly face and dirty deeds continue to plague us today. Babies aren't born hurting, hating and wanting to kill people who are somehow different from them. Over time, some of them develop both particular prejudices and feelings of rage, not just through observing and listening to people who are important to them, but also through propaganda. Propaganda helps well-primed listeners think of themselves as good, even godly. Yes. Um, or as mistreated and betrayed, or both. Either way, they get to feel justified in condoning or participating in violence. If you attended the Gaza Fights for Freedom webinar this past Monday, you heard countless examples of morally disengaged arguments straight from the mouths of the mainstream corporate media. These arguments are designed to justify deadly violence against nonviolent protest marchers, including women, children, the elderly, the disabled, the medics, and the news reporters. What were those marchers doing to incite such violence? Protesting Israeli violations of international laws and agreements. It takes a lot of propaganda to turn such protests into crimes punishable by death. But defenders of the status quo always see challenges to their power as a threat. Next slide. For an example closer to home, think about the forms of propaganda the NRA has propagated to shoot down efforts to control gun control, to have gun control. This slide provides examples of the NRA's use of pseudo-moral justification, euphemistic labeling, advantageous comparison, and diffusion of responsibility. The NRA also glorifies gun ownership by equating it with First Amendment rights. It emphasizes the worthy, self-protective role of guns and insists that guns don't kill people, people kill people. We all know that the NRA's buddies, the arms manufacturers and government contractors use these arguments to reap huge profits. And they do this without ever showing any remorse for the innocent victims shot and killed every day. These gun murders, often mass murders, occur regularly, not just in the U.S., but also in Mexico and all the other places where Americans sell weapons of mass destruction, legally and illegally. Next slide. In a related example, the arms industry and its governmental and media supporters have also done a remarkable job of making drone attacks on innocent civilians seem like a good idea. Again, we have a very powerful segment of the military industrial complex that values profits over lives. Ignoring civilian casualties is easier to do when racism helps devalue those lives. 
In the article cited in this post, the National Security Reporter for the New York Times, Scott Shane, advanced the argument that using drones, quote, to go after terrorists was not only ethically permissible, but also might be ethically obligatory. Do any of you think Scott would use that argument to address the much greater problem in this country of homegrown right-wing white supremacist terrorism? Next slide. All of us here tonight have seen US military involvement in multiple wars, most frequently against peoples with non-WASP identities. Can you think of a single example in which the ruling powers did not say that the other guys started it or did not say that the other guys were such a threat to the survival of democracy that they had to be eliminated? Think about all the years of US troops in Afghanistan. Has any US administration ever admitted to any wrongdoing for the thousands of innocent civilians killed there? And how about what's been going on in Palestine for decades, including this month? Who is displacing responsibility for the violence onto whom? Next slide. This image of the lethal injection room at San Quentin prison should give you the chills, as should its quote from Steven Pinker that, quote, by standards of the mass atrocity in human history, the lethal injection of a murderer in Texas is pretty mild stuff. This quote illustrates a dominant narrative in American society that has sent destructive echoes from the military industrial complex high up on the hill, all the way down to the proud boys on the streets. That narrative says that white Anglo-Saxon American males are superior to everyone else, are entitled to own and control everything, are at risk from jealous, angry, and dangerous people everywhere are always in the right and perhaps even have the, quote, ethical obligation to destroy anyone who doesn't recognize and respect their rightful dominance. Perhaps that narrative explains, in part, why the U.S. is so out of step with international humans, human rights laws as well as having the most nuclear weapons, the most military bases, the fewest restrictions on buying and selling arms, and one of the highest rates of capital punishment in the world. You know the general argument they sell to the public. Better to accidentally kill a few thousand innocent people than give any hostile individual or group an opportunity to harm any of us. Next slide. Why is this little group spending Easter week in 1982 in the, in the Nevada desert advocating beating swords into plowshares? They were part of the huge protests against nuclear weapons and nuclear testing occurring in the post-World War II. And at this time, the protests actually led to reductions in testing and some international agreements. We should recognize that. Sites at the time were chosen for nuclear arms testing based on the rationale that it was better to risk lives and environments in deserts and remote islands than be unprepared for a nuclear assault from Russia. The choice of testing sites also reflects the prevailing narrative in the U.S. about whose lives and whose environments are more valuable than others. And this also makes it easier for power mongers to usurp and poison some areas of the world without much public outcry. 
I say, God bless the protesters who stand up against all that moral disengagement. They are probably our best hope for saving this planet. Next slide. This slide illustrates the forces of moral engagement that can undo each of the forms of moral disengagement. While it's discouraging to think of the many evils enabled by moral disengagement, there are also many reasons to remain optimistic and engaged. If you attended recent webinars with Abby Martin or Daniel Ellsberg, you've heard some strong voices of hope and encouragement for activism. If you weren't there, ask Cole or Brian for the recordings. Here's the bright side to the story. For everyone who uses a pseudo moral justification to promote war, torture, capital punishment, or any other types of legalized inhumanity, there are thousands of morally engaged individuals to confront them. Morally engaged activists advance principled moral arguments in favor of resisting the pressure to follow the leaders for everyone who suggests that drone victims in Yemen are just collateral damage. There are thousands who speak out about the human costs of warfare. To angry mobs yelling, kill now, don't wait for the slaughter, morally engaged people point out better alternatives. For example, through appealing to international law and making collaborative connections. And no matter how hard war profiteers work to sell the value of deadly violence, there are morally engaged people resisting them, not with violence, but with moral agency. These activists attend to the consequences of violence. They exonerated, they exonerate the designated enemies of the moment, and they recognize the humanity of the victimized scapegoats of the power of mongers. Morally engaged activists have humanized the starving and brutalized Yemeni children, the inhabitants of deserts chosen for nuclear testing, the men, women, and children locked up or murdered because they were guilty of being black or brown, and the countless oppressed peoples still struggling to free themselves from colonialism. I know all these causes sound very familiar to all of you here, and almost all of you have been working for at least one of them. I hope the rest of you will find ways to join in. Next slide. And here we have Mahatma Gandhi, without a doubt, one of the outstanding icons for moral engagement. Moral leaders like Gandhi and people I have met through Engaging Peace and MAPA speak truth to power. They refuse to cloak violence in euphemisms. They refuse to blame victims for the violence heaped upon them. They also refuse to pretend that power brokers and weapons manufacturers have no responsibility for the harm ensuing from their actions. Most importantly, their major tool for combating violence and injustice is nonviolence. Like Gandhi, they favor marches and demonstrations to make their voices heard. To those of you here who have participated in demonstrations organized by MAPA and other peace organizations, I say, way to go, keep on marching. Next slide. Engaging, engaging Peace has had numerous posts featuring MLK. Right now, let's think about what he said about moral leadership in 1967, and I quote, it is my deep conviction that ultimately a genuine leader is not a searcher for consensus, but a molder of consensus. On some positions, cowardice asks the question, is it safe? Expediency asks the question, is it politic? 
Vanity asks the question, is it popular? But conscience must ask the question, is it right? And there comes a time when one must take a stand that is neither safe nor politic nor popular, but one must take it because it is right." End quote. Next slide. And here is Bradley Manning, now Chelsea Manning, speaking truth to power, as did Edward Snowden. Both of their tragic stories emphasize some of the risks involved in having the moral courage to be a whistleblower in a country whose government is far from a moral democracy. Manning and Snowden also remind us of the importance of joining together politically, socially, and morally to help create a more just world. To find other models of moral engagement with whom you can work, look at the names and faces on your computer screen right now. You all look morally engaged to me. Keep the faith, babies. Next slide. So in a democracy, even an imperfect one, how specifically can you help create a morally engaged leadership that will support moral engagement in their citizens? In this post, Reverend Dr. Doe West, a member of the Engaging Peace Board of Directors, reminds us of the importance of exercising our right to vote and working for candidates with demonstrated records of promoting peace and justice. In response to posts like this, Engaging Peace received several comments from a subscriber identifying him or herself as LB, taking the position that all politicians are corrupt, LB was particularly critical of our messages urging people to vote. In his or her view, refusing to participate in a rigged system, refusing to vote for the lesser of two or more evils was itself an act of moral engagement. If we have time during the Q&A, I'd like to hear from you whether or not you think refusing to vote can be a form of moral engagement, or is it just another form of moral disengagement? Although many, slide, many, although many peace activists are frustrated with the levels of moral disengagement often seen in every branch of our government, Please remember the exceptions. I'm sure everyone here can name at least one Supreme Court justice and at least one president who demonstrated at least some and perhaps a lot of moral engagement. Part of our job as peace activists is to woo the moral engagers, engage them, educate them, and reinforce their promotion of peace and social justice. One example of a moral engager identified by Engaging Peace is Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. She has demonstrated moral engagement even in the face of relentless, vicious personal attacks. So gang, let's keep working to persuade her to demonstrate moral engagement in response to all the opportunities to address the threats to peace and social justice that continue to haunt us. Next slide. When Pat and I began engaging peace back in 2010, we dedicated to two people who in our view exemplified moral engagement, Howard Zinn and Frida Rabelsky, both of whom have been faculty at BU. Here are just a few other examples of people we value for their moral agency. If we had another hour, we could mention many more. For example, in one set of posts on engaging peace, my friend Tony Marcella and I identified 500 peace and justice advocates worthy of recognition. And he's encouraged me repeatedly to start another list. In another set of posts, Alice Lo Cicero, another member of our board of directors, 
contributed a great series to engaging peace on the psychological tactics used to cultivate terrorists. The best way to see more of the people whose work we admire is to, is to visit the Engaging Peace website. Next slide. This slide represents our hopes for the future, that the work of mass peace action in concert with other activist organizations will contribute to the flowering of peace and social justice in our time. By working together and exercising our moral agency, I think we can make a million flowers of peace bloom. And while we admire the artwork Joe has created here, I'd like to turn the mic over to him, our superb cartoonist, Joe Campbell. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, indeed, my name is Joe Kandra. Um, after Pat and Kathy's uh, wonderful talk here, uh, don't expect anything as deep from me. Uh, I'm just a I'm just a poor little pixel pusher. So I've, I've been making cartoons for Engaging Peace since uh, 2019, and I'll be uh, making some for MAPA in the future. Uh, you can go in the next slide so they don't have to see my face. Uh, so political and editorial cartoons can be powerful tools for social change. Uh, cartoons represent uh, present accessible and instant commentary and analysis on current affairs, and, and when done well, political cartoons can shine a spotlight on the ridiculous, the hypocritical, and the corrupt. Go on to the next slide, please. Uh, a great early example are the cartoons of Thomas Nast in the, in the Gilded Age. Uh, Nast was an illustrator who created not only the American Santa, but the donkey and elephant mascots, if you click, uh, for the Democratic and Republican parties. Next slide, please. Uh, Nast helped expose and bring down the Tammany Hall political machine and boss William Tweed. Uh, Tweed reportedly didn't care if stories were printed about the corruption he controlled because most of his constituents couldn't read, but they could see the pictures. He was so threatened by Nast's illustration that he gave orders to stop the pictures. So he tried to bribe and intimidate Nast into silence. He also tried to bribe the publishers uh, ultimately, Nast was uh, brought down and he died in jail. Next slide, please. So just lately, a certain a former president of the United States has been dogged by cartoons the last few years. And some actions of a certain American political party you can go to the next slide, please. So political cartoons have a long history of exposing the hypocrisy and moral disengagement of war. And these are just samples from just the last few wars. Okay, next slide, please. So while uh, I've been working, helping at Engaging Peace, uh, we've tackled some topics like fake news. Next slide. Racism. Next slide, please. Fascism. Next slide. Voting. Next slide. And the pandemic. Uh, next slide, please. So I don't create all these by myself. Um, Kathy or Pat, if you click advance, uh, would uh, send me some information, send me an idea, send me something that they would like to have a cartoon about. Now this could be a standalone cartoon. It could be one that planned uh, to support a planned uh, post at the blog. They would send me a, a description, you could advance. I would, uh, think it over and come up with a sketch and send that back to them. Uh, then we would have a back and forth period where we uh, 
fine tune things. Uh, I give my view, they give their view. And then I ultimately create the final cartoon, next which uh, would then be sent on, published on the website and in the newsletter. And it can also, it was also distributed on social media such as Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and more. And next slide. So unfortunately, at currently, political and editorial cartoons are in hard times. Uh, the consolidation of newspapers at home and abroad has meant fewer cartoon positionists, car fewer cartoonist positions in fewer newspapers each year. I think the uh, uh, 10 years ago, there were 100 political cartoonists in the United States, and maybe there's 30 or so now who are printed in major publications. Uh, the slow death of traditional newspaper syndication model is making it harder to sell cartoons and harder and harder for artists to make a living making political cartoons. However, the expansion of the web and online publishing is creating a whole new way to publish and distribute content the blog, newsletters, websites. Uh, there are more avenues for political, the, the traditional model for political cartoons and editorial cartoons is uh, greatly diminished over, this, over the past few years. Uh, there's also a lot of pressures besides newspapers, uh, lots of uh, political pressures, lots of editorial pressures, a lot of money pressures, but there is as I was saying, uh, the web and online publications are starting up a whole new way of getting information out there. Uh, 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 Engaging Peace blog is a prime example. Um, you don't need to go to a newspaper to get things out. So uh, political cartoons are not dying, they're not going away. They'll be shifting, they'll be changing to whatever the new paradigm is going to be, um, just like pretty much any other content. So things will change, but things will stay the same. And that's basically all I have. Thank you, Joe. Uh, it's interesting what uh, Joe was saying about Boss Tweed and how he wasn't concerned about people reading, but he was concerned about the pictures. And I think that's another testament to the importance of psychology and how uh, we communicate with people. And I think that's one of the reasons we've been so thrilled to have the cartoon element added to the blog. So uh, we're going to get into an open-ended question and answers in a moment, but before we do, I promised you a discussion question to get us started. And that question is this, now that you've learned about moral disengagement and moral engagement, how might you use these concepts in your own life and in your activist work? So we're curious to know how, how can you apply these concepts? What, what meaning did it have for you? What ideas did it spark? So we can open the floor now, Cole. Okay, um, do, you want to, do you have more slides or should we show the gallery of faces now? Um, well, I. We could leave this question up. Let me just show you, remind yeah. you of what moral disengagement and moral engagement are. These are the things that Kathy had talked about, all the different elements of the way language is used, the way propaganda is used, the way self-deception is used, um, and the ways in which people act morally in contrast to that. So um, yeah, let, we can open up the gallery now and um, let's let's hear from some folks. How do you think these concepts apply in the real world? So you can either indicate that you want to raise something by raising your hand. Uh, well, I don't think we can see the view of people now. Wait a minute. We'll try. But you, there's a there's a virtual hand you can raise using the reactions button at the bottom of your screen. Um, or you could type your question or comment in the chat. Does that work? Or you could just go like this and hope that we see you. I mean, I'll go ahead with one. I um, am concerned that uh, those with whom we disagree also have moral reasoning to explain what they do. 
I think the criticism of them is that they're um, taking too narrow a view of the problem. It strikes me that this, this trope of self-defense is so often used. You know, Israel has the right to self-defense, it says. And the United States has nuclear weapons to defend itself. And we have to defend ourselves against terrorists. So there's something like uh, drawing a circle and expressing concern and moral um, responsibility for people within that circle and expressing hostility for those outside or indifference. So um, I don't know, the word engagement or disengagement didn't quite capture it for me. It's almost like a hierarchy of concern and care. Okay, can I respond to that? Please. Um, I've certainly heard that position before that in general, people always want to think of their own point of view as moral. But my basic argument is that there is a fundamental code, again, that's been recognized in more than 11 in religions that you can see in the holy books that say, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I think personally it's my bias is that if the argument that people are making is not co um, consistent with that general value statement then it's not moral it's in some ways self-protective some ways self-enhancing but I don't think it deserves the um, title of moral, the label of moral, if they're saying self-defense for me and my people is so important that nobody else has the right to make us feel afraid and nobody else has the right to keep us from wiping them out if they think they might hurt us. So I do think there's a hierarchy there. And you look at the people who you know, again, the example of the Israelis, of course, all groups, all peoples have the right to self-defense. The question is, how are you going to do that? And if you're following through on that right, and that might be a universal right, there's a lot of universal rights um, identified by the UN, but if you say that right is so important for me and my group that I will do anything to protect me and my group, and if that means using, using nuclear weapons against China, that's what I'm going to do. Pat, do you want to add into that? No, I think you've um, expressed it well. Cole, do you want to uh, come back at that? No, no, I'm happy with that response. Thank you. So um, other, other reactions to the question of how to apply? Yes, Louise Coleman. You're currently muted, so you need to unmute. Okay. Um, well, I have a, it's more like an observation or a, a question, actually. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay. Um, like people like, you know, Martin Luther King Jr. and, and Gandhi and, and other people who stood out from the majority or stood against the majority, how do you think they it's not exactly translate but they they go from like being an outlier from being someone who's against or in opposition to the majority and then is it you think that they're just more adept than other people with expressing themselves and empathizing with people and that's how they draw people to what they think you see what i mean it's like a lot of times people who are different are uh are not listened to and but they you know were obviously very um adept at getting across to people do you understand my question they started out being all alone and then they ended up with this great big movement so how did they do that well i think they were very articulate i think they could really empathize with people mm -hmm. um, and that people could see that I think they had a strong moral message that people with any kind of 
moral training could recognize, even if they didn't like seeing it in somebody different from them. Um, I think they were clearly such strong role models of moral thinking and action that people who wanted to see that had to run to them, flock to them, gather with them. Right. Of course, that was the same power of attracting people with their ideas that led to assassinations. And so, right, right, right. Thank you. That makes sense. Other comments about um, the question of how to apply moral engagement, disengagement, or um, any questions at this point? Phyllis. Uh, yes. Um, I think personally, I have found it uh, quite interesting to see how I react to people who have different ideas. And I found that when I think and speak violently in conversations with people, trying to persuade them <laughs> to change their minds, it doesn't work. And I think that is the power of Gandhi and Martin Luther King. They never engaged in any kind of conversation or, act, or action which made other people feel less than human. And I, I must say that I have learned that that is not the way to convince people because they are entitled to their own opinion. And if I express myself violently, that is another, that is not peaceful. So that is something I have had to work on. Thank you, Phyllis. It's what you're saying is about the congruence between the words and the behavior that if if someone is speaking about peace, like MLK or Gandhi, and their behavior is contrary to that, then they're less believable, less credible. But my mind has to be peaceful before I open my mouth. Uh huh. <laughs> yes, I agree. And, and other, I think other I comments. I, I have a comment, and that's the way that two different strains of thought were used after World War II. So we had a soft power projection of Americanism, but behind the scenes, we had CIA agents working with thugs to break legs. So a lot of our empire seems to have been built behind the scenes outside of the consciousness of a lot of people by men sworn to secrecy that were given weapons to beat people into submission while we were projecting the Pax Americana of this noble group that's not really an empire that's just out to create the peaceful world. So what I'm wondering is, do we discount what happens behind the scenes just because we don't know about it? Or do we assume that sometimes there are people working behind the scenes that make things happen that actually give us the results that we see? I think history tell us, tells us that we have to pay attention to what's going on behind the scenes. I mean, it would take a lot of naivety to assume that everything our government, whoever was in charge did was open and transparent. Um, I think we, ha I mean, what, what you're referring to really when you're talking about the behind the scenes is what's going on behind the scenes that's hidden in propaganda. We are good, we are wonderful, we're the free nation, and don't worry people, you're in good hands. And we would only use nuclear weapons if we had to. Um, so um, I, I think, you know, the, the tricky way is when you see people who are Trumpists, who buy into the propaganda, whose fears are aroused to the point where they're willing to let the government spend a huge portion of its budget on developing nuclear weapons or supporting bases around the world. I think you have to look behind that and say, what's going on? 
that got us to this point and what can I do to stop it? And arguing with people, being angry um, can backfire, um, but cultivating people, supporting people, promoting people who are morally engaged and have the power to unite other peace-minded people behind them, I think is the better way to go. Thanks. Uh, Pat, we have some people raising virtual hands, so why don't we start I calling some of those? on to that. So, um, that was actually Michael Hoey, the first hand he went ahead, but Siddhartha Banerjee is next. Siddhartha? Hi, thank you very much indeed. There are so many ideas. It's difficult to know where to start. Uh, I would think with regard uh, to the last comment that the difference between American hard and soft power, while it was real at one time, uh, it does not really exist as far as I can tell right now because the exercise of American power over the last quarter century or so has become more and more brazen. Whereas uh, in my generation of Indians who were growing up right after independence and um, we were steeped uh, in the middle classes in American culture, American literature, American cinema, uh, we were in a way uh, young Americans, even though uh, we were Indian nationals. That was because, uh, and this point was raised just now, we really didn't see what was going on behind the scenes. So America presented a very attractive face to the world. But as that policy has become more brazen, more violent, more coercive, um, the soft power that America used to use at one time so effectively to win friends and influence people does not really operate, so certainly does not operate very effectively now. Um, Emerson used to say that, you know, what you are stands over you the while and thunders so that I cannot hear what you say to the contrary. I'm afraid that applies right now to the way the US is perceived because there's such a wide gulf between the proclaimed belief and actual behavior. My response is that there have been many um, thoughtful, caring voices of peace in this country, but the heritage of violence goes all the way back to the landing of the Europeans on these shores, um, to slavery, to wiping out the natives peoples, to bringing and horribly misusing um, people of color, black people from Africa. So we do have two histories going side by side. We have the, the, the side um, sort of dominated by the moral disengagers right from the beginning who thought what they wanted was important. They were the children of God. They would bring civilization and development and freedom and all those things to this country. But at the same time, there was this parallel path of the people who were slaughtering native peoples, bringing over black people in chains if they survived the tri trips and mistreating them terribly. So there's two narratives that you have to recognize and you gotta be realistic about the black side, the dark side of what people in this country, the colonizers, did and what's happened since and the voices of liberty, the voices of freedom, the voices of morality of which there have been many along the way. Okay, next up is Jerry. Right, thanks. Jerry Paul. Ross. <clears throat> so thank you for this excellent uh, webinar. And I, I hope I, I don't uh, repeat someone else's question uh, because I was kicked out of Zoom uh, a little while ago and I was wandering in the cyber wilderness for about five minutes or so. So maybe someone's already raised this. Um, some of your um, uh, proposed mechanisms for kind of reestablishing a moral framework seem 
to depend on um, convincing people of facts. Now, I'm thinking of countering euphemisms and uh, uh, speaking the truth. One of the phenomena we seem to be dealing with today is this, uh, these different realities that we seem to have groups of people inhabiting almost entirely different uh, uh, realities and some based on a particular set of facts and others based on a particular set of um, statements of, of, of belief that may not be grounded in reality. Uh, at the same time, that phenomenon seems to be magnified by social media where we have these, these reality bubbles or these information bubbles created and dis dispersed and maintained. So I, I'm kind of throwing this out as a general comment. What do you think about these phenomena? I suppose there's nothing new under the sun, but they seem new. And how do they, uh, how do we uh, deal on a psychological basis with, uh, with, with these and how they seem to limit uh, the effectiveness of some of the uh, other uh, approaches? Be interested in what you have to say. Okay, I think every, everything you've said is right on target. Um, I think there are these two realities and, you know, social media, which in, some ways is great because it gives the new outlets for cartoonists and political activists and um, those of us here tonight, um, especially for the people who are on Facebook. But it's like every tool that human beings seem to develop, there are some people who will um, use it for their own purposes and corrupt it for their own purposes. And it really, it's, it's hard. That's why we asked the question that we asked all of you because this is not a question that's easy to answer. I mean, I am committed to the value of these concepts, but I did say to Pat, you know, what kind of advice will we be giving them about how can they use these ideas, um, these concepts to help them in their activism? Um, and I think arguing with people never goes very far. I think most of us aren't very good arguers. I think we want our own point of view to be listened to. We want to be right. But I think, again, one of the reasons that the best recognized um, icons of moral engagement have the attention and the respect they have is that they did live their lives in terms of what they're saying. And in some ways, Gandhi is a great example, that man who insisted on the simple life, um, the non-acquisitive life. Um, so I think being a role model, I mean, I know if you're facing the Proud Boys, how do you convince the Proud Boys that uh, uh, people of color have as much to offer are uh, as valuable and good as they are. Um, I don't see it as easy. On the other hand, we do know that a lot of people who have joined these kinds of right-wing organizations become disillusioned and disappointed because they don't see those organizations as living up to what their hopes and expectations were for recognition, for admiration, etc. And they leave and they try to tell people, watch out for these kinds of groups. I think what we have to do if we want to be more activists is really pay attention to how we act. Tell the truth, but not browbeat people with it. Um, listen to them. I think being a good listener is really important. Sometimes when you're listening people, they'll end up tripping themselves up with their arguments for why nuclear weapons are good. Um, and I think, I, I believe in the political process. I think it's morally disengaged to not vote, especially when the only people who know are your friends and families and you're not trying to make a public case for what you're doing. You're just saying, I'm morally engaged. I don't enter into that fraud. 
Um, I'm not convinced about that. I hope that answers at least some of your fine question. Great. Okay, next up is going to be Claire Gosselin. You're muted, Claire. Yes, I know. I was just having a hard time with my unmuting process. Um, okay, great. You know, I, I was, you led right into a question I'd already um, had in mind was the, the point about listening, I think is so important. And that's not something we learn to do in this society. We're not taught to have a respectful conversation for the most part. You know, it's always supposed to be quick reactions and, you know, shouting at each other, or I'm talking about in general in, in a lot of spaces. Um, I think, again, as you said, there's a real, the whole substrate or the whole context that we live in as a settler colonial nation for, for centuries and how embedded white supremacy and colonialism is in our mentality. But I think, you know, one thing that struck me a few years ago, I observed when I was at the World Peace Forum in Vancouver, BC, I think it was 2004, it was after Bush was elected again, I felt horrible. But I went there and, and I was on public transit at one point and there was a young man who was also at the social forum. And he was so good about, he was talking to the bus driver and I can't remember what the issue was, but he was just so good about, oh, why do you think that? You know, and it wasn't like, he wasn't like saying, well, that's completely wrong, you know? So I think while we wanna be anchored in, as you said, the golden rule, which I think is a really uh, good model that crosses so many different religions and even people who are not religious. Um, I think that's an important uh, thing to keep in mind, but some of it is how do we have these conversations? How do we listen well? And how do we pose questions that will perhaps linger and be carried forward versus, you know, oh, I know, I know what's right and you're all wrong. I agree, well said. Okay, next up is Andre Sheldon. Uh, namaste, everyone. Peace, salam, shalom. Uh, I believe that people uh, abhor violence. Last week and the week before, when the war was going on, the people around the world were just upset because they don't want violence. So whether it's the Black Lives Matter and the police or in Israel or wherever, that we're, the objective is to try and show that we're not a threat if we're trying to stop that violence. So that's why Gandhi and King, they taught us what to do. They said, commit to nonviolence. That was the, there's the psychology of it, is that yes, if we, that's the first thing we're gonna do is ask everyone to commit to nonviolence. And so the new narrative is committing to nonviolence. And then the second part though, is to work together for humanity so that people see there's something positive going on. So at the same time that they're promoting nonviolence, that <clears throat> you're promoting something positive. So I'd like to ask you what you think about that, that the, really the two are, are important, that they have to work together. Thank you. Thank you um, for your question. Um, I do think we have to work on multiple levels. Uh, I do think we have to be respectful. I think we have to ask good questions. I think we need to respond um, respectfully. Um, and in terms of, just to go back a little bit as well, in terms of speaking truth to power, a lot of these ideas keep fiddling around in my mind. Um, it makes me think of the photograph of that little girl in Vietnam running along the streets naked um, and with her back on fire. And there are lots of ways to speak, to speak truth to power without arguing with people. And I think one of the reasons that the military got so that it would simply embed chosen reporters into their field actions was to make sure there was never a picture like that that would help people, help turn people away from the war that they were involved in or what other um, 
other action they were doing. So it, it goes back to speaking truth to power on as many levels as you can. And sometimes it means cartoons and photographs that tell the truth. And it's hard to get to that point. And I'm yes, not sure I, I answered your question completely though, Andre. No, but thank you. And uh, thank you for posting my program on your slide. I appreciate it very much. And uh, just to take it one step further, what, like how do we respond to the Proud Boys? And it's doing what Claire said to show the listening to what they say. So if they know we're not a threat right from the start, that's if we if we start by saying hello and peace to you, then it's diffusing the, the, the showing you're not a threat right away. And that's why in the program I developed, it, it's a, I call it a global movement of nonviolence because that's what we're doing. We're showing people we're not a threat. So that's why the title, and that's what King and Gandhi were famous for, were movements of nonviolence. So that is my proposal to the, for a new psychology of, of, yes, we want everyone to know that we're not a threat. But thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Andre. And I'd like to say we also need to provide alternatives. One of the real huge immoralities in the support for the military industrial complex is that we don't fund the kinds of programs that provide alternatives for the least privileged um, elements of society. Um, we need to be putting our money into education and healthcare and things like that. So we don't have so many disaffected, angry people who are just simply looking for an outlet for all of their rage and feelings of being disregarded and not heard. I think that's possible. I think we can do better in our schools, by the way, in terms of educating our children, presenting alternatives to them. I think we need to do better with our schools in our most segregated, poor areas so that people see alternatives, alternatives that actually could work for them. We could, we could make that kind of society. If we work hard enough to get the right kind of people into Congress, into judgeships, to get them elected to president, we could do it all. I really believe it. The billions that are spent on, quote, defense as a euphemism, um, could make for a different society. And we can't get it tomorrow. We probably won't get it in 2022, but I think we all should work for that. Okay, we got uh, more people with questions in the chat. So I'm gonna start reading some of those out. Okay, great. Um, John Ruer is asking, if people have the power to hurt another or many others, why do they want to think of themselves as moral or good? Is the desire to be good a cultural construct or is it inherent in the human psyche? What human need is met by wanting to be moral? Hmm. Pat, do you want to respond? That was a very thoughtful. Mm. I think it's a great question. Um, I think the, uh, the sense of morality is built into our upbringing, our religious uh, education, our, you know, pledge allegiance to the flag, the, uh, we're, we're supposed to be moral, we're supposed to be good, it's a cultural expectation. So if someone chooses not to be, then they may need to use these methods of justification and rationalization uh, because it's, I mean, that's not to say that everybody is moral. You know, it's the waiting for an honest man kind of idea. Uh, we're all flawed, but we have expectations of ourselves and expectations of members of society that we will be as a cultural norm. I'd like to add to that, that I think there is something pretty inherent. I think some kind of maybe primitive 
concept of do unto others as you would have them do unto you helped human beings survive, helped them evolve. I think in how the threatening nature of what must have the most of the environment must have been as human beings were evolving meant joining together, helping each other, um, helped human survival. So I would say probably we're talking about nature and nurture working together. And I think as human beings evolved to the point where they could survive more easily and didn't have to worry just about survival, but could worry about getting powerful and dominant and all those kinds of things, um, there are lots of opportunities to learn, hear about ways to protect that and develop it. All the okay. talked about that. Great, here's one from Catherine Shira from Santa Fe, New Mexico. She writes that that's where Los Alamos National Laboratory and its nuclear weapons production activity is a serious presence. At present, the dialogue in the community around Los Angeles National Laboratory is almost completely dominated by the economic benefits of its activities, while almost completely ignoring the moral issues. How can we engage the community around the moral questions? I think here there's simply so much evidence that the money going into things like nuclear testing could be used in so much better ways to actually support those communities who have bought into the idea that if they're not building nuclear war arms, they have nothing. I think a number of members of um, NAPA have made that argument, have the data, um, are educating other members of MAPA like me in terms of the facts, in terms of what could be done to serve those communities in better ways than being part of a system that could destroy life on earth. Anybody else? Pat, Joe? Yeah, um, I, one of the things I've been ruminating about as I listen to this discussion is that we could just boil down the entire moral, <clears throat> excuse me, argument into the distinction between love and fear. And what the, what Kathy just described about the economic arguments are, those are based on fear. If we don't have these nuclear weapons facilities, then we won't have jobs. Uh, we will be poor. We will, will not be able to support the um, infrastructure and the social systems and so forth that we need. So it's, it's fear and the, um, you know, the contrast between the, the previous administration uh, that fostered that everything was about fear. It was about hatred, fear, anger. Those are all bundled up with fear, hatred and anger. Versus when Joe Biden came in, he said, well, no, let's, let's get along with each other. Let's love each other. Let's have dogs at the White House and have fun and laughter and Valentine's on Valentine's Day. And let's take care of each other and actually s spend money towards supporting children. And the, that contrast between fear and love is, is huge. And the, um, the golden rule, if you look at those illustrations uh, from the, the few religions that we talked about today, it's all about love. Uh, you know, can you love somebody else the way you love yourself? Would, would you love somebody the way you love your family members? The way you love your dog? Uh, people care more for their pets than they do for other human beings. Um, that if we follow the rule of love, it will not take us to moral disengagement. The moral disengagement res resides in the world of fear. We have to get people to go to war. We have to talk about the other, the, the people who are going to steal our future because they're different from us. That's all based on trying to pull out the fear in people. So I think I've wandered from the, the actual topic, but it's, it's kind of a summary thing that I wanted 
to add to the discussion. Great. Uh, I have to push back a little bit, Pat. Uh, people trying to preserve their jobs, that's not, that's a, that's a bit reductive to call that fear, right? So the, the instinct for self-preservation, you can call it fear if you want, but um, people have legitimate needs and interests, and it's not just fear that causes them to be concerned about that. Jobs arguments can be turned into a positive. They're not always negative. Uh, to me, the better answer to the workers at Los Alamos Laboratory is a just transition. We're going to build, we're gonna use your talents and your, to, to build something positive, to build the new solar technology or, or I don't know the right technology, you know, but um, gosh, if we're just gonna blame people for, uh, for having bad morals because they wanna keep their jobs, we're never gonna, uh, th this activist over here is never gonna win a majority in Los Alamos, forget it. Pat, I don't think you were blaming people. No, I, I didn't mean to imply that, Cole. Um, I think I was talking about the, the ways in which people are manipulated by drawing on their fears so that the arguments that are made by the weapons industry that you will lose your job we're play on the fears that people have about losing their job. I'm not saying that they're wrong to have those fears. Of course they want their jobs, but um, just tagging along with what Kathy said, there are alternative ways to address people's fears by um, talking about alternative ways of using the economy to support them and their jobs. Right, got it, okay. Um, I don't really see anything that's a real sharp question in the chat. I think Michael has another one. Um, yes. Beth Summers says that there are national and international groups that assist supremacists in recovery after they leave the organizations. Movements like Life After Hate. And by the way, MAPA presented a movie about Life After Hate a couple months ago with some panelists from the uh, these groups are available for individuals leaving racist groups such as KKK, Nazi groups, Proud Boys, etc. I'm not sure if there's a question there or if panelists would like to comment on that observation. Well, I agree that that film was great, um, Life After Hate, and I think the point is a good one, that we need to have resources for people who have been or will be um, pulled into hate groups because the rest of their life um, is in some ways horrifying, disappointing, whatever. Um, uh, so I think the film was good and I think the point is good. Um, okay, let's give the last question to Michael, go ahead. Okay, so piggybacking on what Andre was saying about nonviolence reminds me of a man by the name of Gene Sharp who wrote a book on nonviolence. But the awkward thing is that the National Endowment for Democracy has taken over for the CIA in using nonviolence to prepare people to overthrow their governments all around the world. And so when we see all these colored revolutions, we don't realize that that was our tax dollars creating false unions, well, in a sense, true unions, I guess, for these people and new chambers of commerce and all these other things to develop a loyal audience, so to speak, that would then act on the behalf of American empire to make, say, Ukraine or Georgia or someplace more friendly to oil and gas interests, because that's basically the source of power is being able to have people in these countries support or selling them or helping to transport the oil and natural gas. So my concern is that many times some of the best laid out plans and some of the most noble ambitions are twisted in a sense to maintain power. And so I'm wondering since our tax dollars are spending all this money on the National Endowment for Democracy and USAID and it gets diverted to NGOs that are trying to promote American empire, what they call democracy, how, where does this leave us 
should we just ignore that stuff or should we somehow try to incorporate how the CIA uses nonviolence into how we think nonviolence should be used? Hmm. I think we need to be vigilant. I think all of us here are privileged one way or another. Um, we have reaped a number of benefits from American society that the majority of the population does not. And I think it wasn't just a matter of, um, uh, um, oh, I'm sorry, of um, misusing originally great ideas. I think the bad ideas, i.e. to help the military industrial complex were there from the beginning and they're hidden in euphemistic language, et cetera. So I think it's our job. I really believe that all of us to make sure, I and mean, we can't all do it all by ourselves. That's why we need to collaborate. No person here, no matter how brilliant he is, can keep track of every, um, every bad idea, every selfish attempt going on in the world. But you have groups, you have groups like MAPA, some people work on immigrants and some people work on nuclear weapons and some people work on what's going on in Latin America. And in your groups, you get to have as much expertise and knowledge as you can. You share among groups and you're active. You get that knowledge out. You petition your Congress people, you send them. Uh, I think activism is the answer. I think loving, caring activism and a commitment of your time and your energy, whatever you've got, has to be towards um, making the better world. And that means working together. Amen. Amen. Okay, well, let me turn it back to Pat, Kathy, and Joe, if they have some closing remarks. Joe, why don't you have something to say? I've had my share. <laughs> Uh, you said everything I was going to say. So, Pat, uh, I I have found this to be very rich. The um, the information in the presentations, the discussion, the commitment that so many of you have, the the passion that's been expressed in the questions and in your hanging in for this whole thing. Uh, it's over an hour and a half. So I feel, um, I feel inspired. One of our goals for the webinar was to inspire you. And um, I feel inspired. So I hope you do too. And I once again, encourage you to read the Engaging Peace blog, because there is so much more to this discussion than what we've been able to cover today. And I hope that the material will um, be beneficial to you and support you in the, the amazingly wonderful work that you are doing. So thank you again for this opportunity to uh, bring Engaging Peace to you. And I thank you all too. I thank Cole and all the MAPA people for the work that they're doing. Thank you all and thank you our presenters for some extremely stimulating concepts and there's a lot to carry forward with us tonight. Thank you all for coming. Good night. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.